All right, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us and happy Monday. I'm James Fuccioni from the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative. And we're fortunate today to have Terry Fulmer from the Johnny Hartford Foundation and Chris Kohler from the Millbank Memorial Fund uh, to have a conversation on healthy aging. And what we do a lot in Massachusetts is we concentrate uh, on what is going on in communities and what's going on statewide. But this, uh, this set of presentations and this conversation is about learning what else is happening, what, about, what other opportunities out, are out there across the country for us to collaborate, what are some innovative policies, programs, and ideas that we can take and we can think about in Massachusetts or wherever you're listening from. So um, what we're going to do is have, uh, I'm gonna give a, a quick intro presentation and then we're gonna have Terry Fulmer present and have a reaction from two of our age and dementia friendly communities, uh, Emily Shea at the Age Strong Commission in the city of Boston as well as Samantha Hamilton from the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, uh, who is leading the Age and Dementia Friendly uh, Springfield Initiative. Um, we also have Chris Kohler from the Millbank Memorial Fund will then present with a reaction and question each from uh, Laura Kitross from the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission, who is the uh, leader of Age Friendly Berkshires, and Christine Sullivan um, at Coastline Elderly Services, who is um, leading and managing uh, the Age-Friendly New Bedford Initiative. So with that, again, thank you very much. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Just a quick note to make sure everybody knows. Um, and I'm going to start sharing if I can ever figure out how to use technology, which is always, always a tricky thing. Um, just one moment, please. All right, here we go. So again, the Massachusetts Healthy Aging Collaborative, um, many of you attending uh, work with us, partner with us, support us. Uh, but for those who are unaware, we are a cross-sector network supported by the Tufts Health Plan Foundation, our Executive Office of Elder Affairs, Mass Councils on Aging, uh, AARP Massachusetts, and Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley North Shore. Um, and we are a cross-sector network. We have collected and partnered with all kinds of organizations, both in sort of the aging services and support space, but outside of that traditional space as well, all kind of centered around a goal to uh, support and promote inclusive age and dementia friendly communities. So we have this cross sector network, knowing that we cannot do this work alone, we cannot create communities if we do not, that are uh, great places to grow up and grow old, if we don't partner with communities and listen to communities. And communities are not uh, one size fits all, especially in Massachusetts. We have 351 very different cities and towns. So we have, we engage a range of partners uh, in housing, in transportation, social participation, and across age and dementia friendly themes to make sure we can um, support whatever it means to a community to be a great place to grow up and grow old. Just an idea of what that looks like in Massachusetts. We are up to 73 uh, designated age-friendly communities from both World Health Organization and AARP. It's the most of any state, and we also have a number of regional approaches to this work, um, which could help sort of capture another 100 communities uh, you know, in the next, hopefully in the next year. We, we also have around 60 dementia friendly communities and our mass councils on aging association is the backbone organization for um, for the dementia friendly Massachusetts initiative. They've come up with a pledge and luckily we've been able to kind of merge and align this work and create a first in the country age and dementia friendly integration toolkit that gives communities an idea of how you can do and engage in both age and dementia friendly work. Our statewide age friendly and dementia friendly plan called Reimagine Aging, you can see the MA, just a little play on our, on our state abbreviation. Uh, we have um, created uh, our year one progress report. We were, the, we were among the first states to become age friendly on a statewide basis 
thanks to the governor's council to address aging in Massachusetts. And so our year one progress report came out sort of in the middle of the pandemic. And you can see this quote from the letter from uh, Governor Charlie Baker, um, just giving a nod to the fact that communities led to led the, the input that created this report. Um, the, there was a statewide listening tour with more than 500 uh, people that contributed to this report. And it's, if you read the quote, you can see the communities continue to lead and through partnership and collaboration, we can continue to address um, any issues we face. And that's further emphasized by a report that was supported by the Tufts Health Plan Foundation that, that we were also a part of, we were lucky to be a part of with the Executive Office of Elder Affairs, um, just talking about and researching protective factors uh, for older adults dis disproportionately, disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and what it means to um, support older adults during the pandemic. And so there are a number of findings, uh, but having a sort of intergenerational awareness and structure, uh, having skillful and nimble uh, community-based organizations that know community residents, you know, have leaders with a passion for the community or a history of coming together in past crises. Um, it's basically another way to promote the fact that through partnership and collaboration, we have seen that age and dementia friendly community work has been another way that we can bring communities together and bring regions together so that communities can respond better when things like the pandemic come up, that you don't have to create a new relationship. You have relationships already built in that you can use uh, to support your residents of all ages. So we have lots of great resources and materials that is uh, on our website, Mass uh, Healthy Aging Collaborative, that'll be part of the follow-up to this. But we want to get to the presentations now. So I'm going to turn it, turn things over to Terry Fulmer from the John A. Hartford Foundation, who we very much appreciate you and Chris being here today to present to us and let us know uh, what you're working on and what you see as sort of the next phases of, of this work. So I'll allow you to introduce yourself and the work. And thank you very much, Terry. Thank you, James, and really good to be with everybody today and to hear all the great work going on in Massachusetts, no surprise, with so many terrific leaders uh, and innovators in the Commonwealth. So I'm really happy to be with you today and to be able to talk about and build on some of the points you just made, but talk a little bit about um, what's going on uh, in the partnerships that we have with our age-friendly health system work and to talk about our plans for an age-friendly global ecosystem and certainly touching on what we have seen in nursing homes and what we have to do for the future in order to reimagine care and what needs to happen. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the foundation, talk about COVID in nursing homes, something we all know deeply, uh, and then thinking about age-friendly health systems and age-friendly public health systems to sort of round out uh, and fit in with what you're doing in Massachusetts and ask for your guidance and also give you some ideas. Next slide. So our mission at the Johnny Hartford Foundation is very simple. We are dedicated to improving the care of older adults. Everything we do is evidence-based. We have been uh, at our work uh, and specifically related to um, older adults since the early 1980s. And we do it through three priority areas, our age-friendly health system initiative. So creating age-friendly health systems, because as we've started our work, there weren't any, and we know that we can do this. Um, support for family caregivers, the 40 mil million family caregivers out there are saying, what do I do now? And the serious illness, improving serious illness in end of life care. And all of you can see immediately how those three things intersect all day long everywhere. Next slide. So COVID-19, how could it be that we would have this type of crisis of care for older adults in long-term care facilities, skilled nursing facilities? We know that there are 20,000 known cases in facilities, that the, the um, death rates have been horrific with over 80,000 people. Long-term care cases as a share of that total case, 
and long-term care deaths as a share, 40%, while only um, a small fraction, 0.5% of older adults live in long-term care. So this was devastating. And you see the states where it was most devastating and uh, something that all of us just uh, were, were thrown into such a lurch thinking, how can this be going on? Next slide. In Massachusetts, where uh, I live, I lived for about half of my career, continue to be there very often, had two of my kids there. Um, you know, thinking about recent data from Massachusetts, we had our, our um, March, April, May devastation, and then we kind of controlled things and now the surge again. So these data from as recently as October 23rd from WBUR saying COVID-19 hits mass nursing homes hard, especially those serving people of color. Uh, the Herald talking about five residents who died in, in Chelmsford and mass residents worried about family members living in nursing homes with a possible surge. So again, the long-term care facilities with known cases to the top left of your slide showing us the numbers. And it, it goes beyond our wildest imagination that this could have happened, but all of us are working to say never again. Next slide. So what were the biggest issues in nursing homes that continue to this moment? Staffing. Staffing is exceptionally important for uh, stemming the tide of COVID-19 or any infection in nursing homes. Infection prevention control and having that infection prevention specialist with you in order to guide you through all of the moments of an infectious outbreak. Personal protective equipment. So many of us saw that the nursing homes were the last places to get any PPE. It was all triage to critical care. And people then said, whoops, we need to get it to our nursing homes. Social isolation as a devastating impact of, of the, what we've needed to do is we've closed down nursing homes and taken away visitation, uh, which is really eliminating family caregivers from doing what they do all the time, which is providing care in nursing homes. And then we've seen drastic racial ethnic disparities. Again, this is just so unacceptable. And American nursing homes are not designed, operated, or funded to deal effectively with infectious disease epidemics, and their staff are too few in number, inadequately paid, protected, and trained. And I'm proud to be able to work with Chris Kohler and Jack Rowe in thinking about how to reimagine nursing home care. Next slide. The disaster presents opportunities. Next slide. So for us at the foundation, we said we got together a group of stakeholders and said, what should we do urgently and what should we do emergently? So very quickly, and I do mean quick, it was by the end of March, we began funding the National Nursing Home Huddle, which was every day led by IHI, Alice Bonner, well known to everybody from Massachusetts, your previous Secretary for Aging, um, with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement also in Boston as a part of our age-friendly system, working on National Nursing Home Huddles that went every day until last week, so as 18 month, 18 week um, set of huddles, which now have evolved into the Nursing Home Echo COVID-19 Action Network. And so our modest grant of $300,000 turned into a $255 million uh, grant from ARC to support Echo. So stay tuned and please participate in that. And then that was urgent. And then emergently, we did it a, a funding for the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to launch a study on nursing home safety and quality. And that's underway. Betty Farrell is the chair of that. If I please ask you to go to that website to learn about their study, which will take about 18 months. And then emergently, we also funded the Frameworks Institute to re-examine how to reframe the nursing home narrative. It is not fair to have the newspapers slam nursing homes uh, at, with one broad brush and say that they're all death traps, nor is it fair for nursing homes not to be held accountable. Next slide. So we need an age-friendly ecosystem. And James already talked about that, but I will say that this would not happen if we had better systemness. So in 2007, WHO released, released a guide called Global Age-Friendly Cities. And we got pretty excited about that. I was the, at uh, a member of the New York Academy of Medicine board at that time. And they moved out quickly to really see what they could do to get New York City to be age friendly as Boston did. In 2012, AARP established a network of age friendly states and communities as the WHO fit of affiliate. And then in 2016, the John A. Hartford Foundation, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement with the American Hospital Association and Catholic Health Association introduced the concept of age-friendly health systems. And in 2017, working with 
Trust for America's Health in, in uh, Washington, DC, led by John Arbuck, former commissioner for health for the state of Massachusetts. There's a theme here. So um, thinking about uh, what we could do to create age-friendly public health systems because cities and communities cannot be age-friendly without age-friendly care and age-friendly health systems and age-friendly public health systems. Next slide. So we invite everybody to be in partnership with this work on our age-friendly health system initiative through those websites and through that work. And next slide. Our aim is to build a social movement so that all older adults get age-friendly care guided by an essential set of four Ms, what matters, medication, mentation, mobility, and it's consistent with what matters to older adults and their families. Next slide. We have a forum framework, which I'm hoping is well known to you, uh, that uh, IHI did with very wonderful precision and it's working very nicely out there in the field. Next slide. And we're working with CVS Minute Clinics. 100% of CVS Minute Clinics are, create, are committed to being age-friendly and they've launched that with over 1900 uh, providers. It's in their Epic record. And if you go online and, and follow that, we're really proud of our partners at CVS. Next slide. We have an age-friendly care helping consumers understand the 4Ms. Again, you have to start with a community. And so this is a video that anybody can Google and get where Marcus Escovedo from the Johnny Hartford Foundation, our senior, uh, vi our vice president for communications did just a great job working with me to work with NBC. And we had 14 million hits for that. Now I'm told 14 million hits is a very good thing. So we want everybody in the public to say, I demand age-friendly care, I deserve it. Next slide. So we ask all of you to join us in that work. We have over 850 sites, every state in the country and another dozen countries joining us. We have Friends of Age-Friendly quarterly calls. Next slide. <coughs> and if that's the last slide, just let me know. Next slide. And our vision is that every state and many local health departments have age-friendly specialists or divisions which promote overall health, not just one or two health risks, create conditions in home and community to foster good health and develop partnerships. And this is the wonderful work of TIFA. Next slide. So we want to partner with Trust for America's Health. We've had pilots in Florida. Next slide. And Florida is this wonderful um, example of what can happen when a state decides that they're gonna have age-friendly public health. So we, we were hoping to get in 15 counties, 37 counties or two thirds of the state joined us right away, linking with AARP age-friendly age -friendly care, dementia-friendly care and friend effort. So we've now expanded to Michigan and Mississippi with 13 more states in the queue. Next slide. So in closing, this picture is Don Berwick, another you know, favorite son of Massachusetts, where I would say, where would we be without the leadership of IHI? Don is chair of our advisory committee. We're committed to age-friendly public health systems because we know that if we get this right, we will never see nursing homes at such a disadvantage again. And I'm gonna turn it over to my friend, Chris Kohler, who's gonna continue. So Terry, we're actually gonna take a, a break right now and we're gonna have a couple of our communities react to that amazing presentation of how we're trying to tie all of these different things with whether it's an age friendly or dementia friendly label or something just similar enough uh, to each other so that we can all work in collaboration. And so what I'm going to do is ask uh, Emily Shea uh, from the uh, Commissioner of the Age Strong uh, Commission in the City of Boston to join us in video, unmute yourself and introduce and have a reaction and question for Terry. Go right ahead, Emily. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thanks so much, James. And uh, Terry, thank you for that presentation. It's uh, so wonderful to hear your work there at the Hartford Foundation, your work in the, in the hospitals and with the public health systems. Um, just really exciting and I think very much dovetails with a lot of the work that the age-friendly communities are doing out there and um, some real opportunities, I think, to bring bring things together. Um, so, so James, um, uh, Thanks. As James said, my name is Emily Shea. I'm the commissioner at the City of Boston's Age Strong Commission. Um, so we're a department under our mayor, Mayor Walsh at the City of Boston, and also Boston's Council on Aging and Area Agency on Aging. 
Um, so I think James asked me to do this today because in 2005, we launched our Age-Friendly Boston Project. It's our age and dementia-friendly work. Um, to do that, we talked to over 4,000 Bostonians. Um, we created an implementation plan uh, through uh, what I think was really importantly a community-based process. Um, and we've spent the past three years working with our many amazing partners on the implementation of this plan. Uh, so some of the things that we've done, uh, we've done age and dementia friendly training for all of our frontline city staff. We held a Boston Senior Civic Academy to get older adults more engaged in uh, the uh, you know, civic life and, and uh, more prepared to feel more prepared about speaking out on issues that they care about. Um, and we've also launched an ageism campaign designed to break down the stereotypes around aging. So we're now developing an action plan for our next age-friendly iteration where we'll be deep, deeping, dig, digging deeper into elder economic security, social isolation, dementia, and more um, with, through a lens of equity and diversity. Um, one of the things that's come up in the, uh, during COVID for us, which um, I, I think is leading to what hopefully will be a nice result is we had one of our, our age-friendly hospitals, Mass General Hospital reach out to us um, a, a couple of months ago during the pandemic. And they said, you know, um, we're getting, we're seeing people in the emergency room, we're getting worried about folks being at home, and we're getting worried about the increase in falls. Um, we know that people are um, getting out to walk in the summer in the parks, but what's going to happen in the winter? So now we pulled in lots of partners and we're all collaborating around how to create um, age-friendly walking spaces that really promote uh, physical activity and walking uh, during the winter in a, in a safe way. Um, so Terry, my question for you today is, given the pandemic has elevated social isolation and loneliness as a concern for people of all ages, not just older adults, as well as the related health impacts, could collaboration on this issue be a bridge between age-friendly communities and age-friendly public health systems? Oh, Terry, you're on mute, sorry. Thank you for that question, Emily. And, and, you know, again, congratulations on all the progress you have already made and are making in Massachusetts. You really, you really are a beacon for others who are watching your work. Um, yes, it's all about connectivity and building bridges across all the elements of care. I think about a day when, suppose you were at Mass General and you went home to Woburn, Massachusetts, and your public health office knew that you might need a home visit and that somebody could come see you or connect with you and that you had that type of, of community-based knowledge and capacity to have seamless care. That, that to me would be um, where we all should be heading. And think about if you, if you um, uh, needed rehabilitation, if you decided to do that in the home, what if somebody were there and knew and they could Zoom with you or they could do um, you know, a teleconference with you to follow your progress. This is the kind of seamless coordinated care that we so need. And the public health system has really been, I'm gonna say it, gutted over the past couple of decades to the point where um, we've put them at such a disadvantage. So getting our public health systems back to the capacity that we need to be a healthy and strong set of communities and states is where we need to be. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Emily, for that. And thank you, Terry, again. And we have one more uh, community that is going to be in this conversation with you, Terry, and that is uh, Springfield, Mass. So we have Samantha Hamilton from the Public Health Institute of Western Mass, working with uh, an age and dementia friendly community and also an age friendly health system. So Samantha. Are you unmuted and go right ahead and introduce yourself and take it away. Thank you. Thank you, James. And thank you, Terry, for the presentation. It's very enlightening and a lot of ahas and wow moments in just hearing how you're framing an age-friendly ecosystem. Um, 
I am um, Samantha Hamilton. I am the Liverpool Springfield Program Manager under the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. The Public Health Institute is a regional organization that does research, evaluation, and coalition convening. Um, one of the projects that we've been working on aggressively was our age-friendly efforts. And I'm excited and proud to, to say that Springfield is not just an age-friendly city, it's a, not just a dementia-friendly city, but it is also has an age-friendly hospital system. Um, we were the first in this US to have this designation. Um, and with our efforts around assessing aging, we looked at specifically two of the domains, housing and transportation for, Spring, for Springfield residents. Um, we had the opportunity to assess um, what those issues are for older adults and talk to residents about what their concerns are. But most importantly, what I've learned from community is that once we assess, they wanna understand what happens next. So we hosted an age-friendly summit in June of 2019 that highlighted what we learned about aging for older adults um, when it comes to their housing and transportation needs. But we did uh, dabble a little bit on some findings related to social isolation as you shared with us. Um, the other thing is that we've done since the COVID um, was to pivot our efforts to say, what are some immediate supports that we can provide to families and older adults um, during the pandemic? And we decided to use our emergency food distribution project to get a fresh produce to older adults that were encouraged to stay at home early on in the pandemic. And we just wrapped up this project. Um, we were able to distribute 5,000 produce boxes over 27 weeks to older adults and families. And we know that it's a small impact to the bigger issue of the issue of COVID in the long term need to have a long-term plan as you're sharing about what can we do. Um, seeing that Springfield is an age-friendly city with um, collaborations in the age-friendly hospital, hospital system, I wanted to, um, to ask, um, in Springfield, our age-friendly, dementia-friendly communities initiative is in collaboration with the age-friendly hospital system. Given your role as a funder and a champion for the age-friendly health system, but also a personally a clinician, what value can the community and the health system bring to each other through the collective um, collaborative work? Thank you, Samantha. And again, congratulations to you in Springfield for all that uh, you've accomplished so far. Uh, you know, it all starts in the community, doesn't it? You have to ask your community members what matters to them find out their goals and preferences, find out how they want to access the healthcare system, you know, Springfield, the, the hospital, and, and to be sure that we are aligning with their goals and preferences. Most people are not in a hospital, they are home. And if they are in a hospital, they're not there long before they get back home. So it's such a little short snippet and you have to get that right. But the coordination and collaboration with the community is everything. Otherwise, my patients come back. I'm an nurse, my patients come back. So, so what you're doing is so essential. And here are three things that Springfield can, can teach us. And we wanna learn from you. We want our age-friendly health system and age-friendly uh, communities and cities to be reliable. We can't have it be in a couple of neighborhoods, but not all the neighborhoods. How can we create reliability so that every older person says, well, I, I deserve age-friendly communities and age-friendly healthcare. We can explain to them what that means and tell them what it is and tell them how to be sure they're getting it. So that's something I'm working on. And I'm gonna, Samantha, I already told you, I'm gonna be reaching out to you. So reliability. And then how can we go deep? We don't want a surfacey program that's glitzy with a lot of cool posters that don't mean anything. So it's gotta be deep and embedded is the third point. You've got to be embedded. How do you get embedded? Well, you get into policies and regulations and you get into payment structures and all the ways that we're not going away. You know, it's just, we're age friendly and we're not going away. And so uh, you see on the left, the picture, there's Don Berwick. We have the t-shirt. Now we got to make it stick. And so that's what we have to learn from you. And I hope that helps. Very much so, thank you very much. I'm happy back to James. Okay. Yep, that's amazing. Terry and Samantha and Emily, thank you all so much. And Terry, as you can see, I think the reason we have such great statewide presence and work is because we have great leaders and communities 
that are working to tie all these different things together and people that are tired of having different, as you said, the, what did you say? A better system this. I think we have people that are working on better system this. So I'm going to, I'm going to steal that quote from you and start putting it in my presentations. Good. <laughs> just want to warn you beforehand. It's a thing like Jerry Seinfeld. It's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah, no, we're, we're going to make it a thing and we appreciate that. Sure. Thank you very much. All right. So now we're going to move on to uh, another uh, leader in this work that's going to share some of uh, some more policies and programs that will help uh, get us thinking about um, other things that, that we can do and other partners we can bring to the table. And that's Chris Kohler from the Millbank Memorial Fund. I'll allow you to introduce yourself, but thank you so much for being here today. And I will advance your slides. Go right ahead, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, James. I guess I got to vamp a little bit while you're uh, bringing up the other slides. Sorry, or, or if it's the next one, there we go. Um, next slide, please. So um, what I'm going to uh, do is try to complement the great overview that Terry gave. And um, I think mostly my job is to uh, try to give you a sense of some of the ideas that are going on in um, other parts of the country that can inform the work that you're doing based on the context that Terry set. So after a bit of description of the fund, I'm going to talk about sort of the, if, if uh, Terry talked about um, kind of nursing homes and the impact of COVID on nursing homes and the opportunity that that provides. And she and I have written on this with Jack Rowe. Um, what's the alternative? Um, and hopefully we can get a good conversation going. It's really great. I'm looking now at the bottom. We got 73 participants on just the fact that you've got folks in communities talking about this work across the state. And this is kind of where I'll close. It's just such a strong base for you folks to work on. So that's, you've got a running start on this stuff. Um, the fund is an operating foundation. We are literally around the corner from the John A. Hartford Foundation when Terry and I are together in New York. You could string a telephone tin can system for us to communicate. And we are a policy shop. We work to improve population health. Um, working with state leaders and decision makers primarily on the best available evidence and experience. Um, and aging is one of the areas that we're working on because uh, we just, as, as you folks do, we see the needs out there and we see the needs increasing going forward and we wanna help state health policymakers um, get ready for that. I should note for this conversation by way of context, I'm just south of you. Um, when I'm not in New York, I'm, I'm hanging out in Rhode Island, which is where I got to know uh, Karen Vosey from the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation. And, um, you know, so we interact, you know, I'm literally a stone's throw from Seekonk, so I interact with Massachusetts all the time. Also, by way of disclosure, I'm on the board of Commonwealth Care Alliance. It's an unpaid position, but CCA works on a lot of these sorts of issues, and to the extent you came across it, I didn't want you to be surprised. It hasn't influenced uh, the presentation that I'll talk about here at all. Next slide, please. So um, Terry talked about the need to reimagine nursing homes. If we're gonna reimagine nursing homes, we have to reimagine our community-based services for older Americans. That means helps with what um, Terry and Jack and I referred to as the unpacking of nursing homes, because we're really asking them to serve a lot of different functions. That's unfair. It's why they've kind of been overwhelmed by COVID, but also to reduce future demand for um, uh, nursing homes as it's currently envisioned. As um, uh, Terry talked about the COVID-19 crisis has only sharpened the need for um, a better community-based care system. And historically, in a lot of states, people rely on Medicaid to develop this community-based care system. Um, we think in some ways you have to move upstream. You have to um, uh, not wait for people to be eligible for Medicaid, but thinking about this in, uh, James, you had it in kind of a, a, a system way um, rather than what has been, we think, kind of the classic state reaction, which is sort of close your eyes until people land on Medicaid. And when they land on Medicaid, it's too late. You know, they've been there. Think about the path to Medicaid. It's often, I'm, I'm older, I'm frail, I get hospitalized, I get sent into nursing homes, I go past my rehab care, and um, I stay there longer term, and all of a sudden, I'm a candidate for long-term care, I get pauperized and boom, I'm on Medicaid. I think we can do better than that going forward. Next slide, please. 
We think that there are six elements around a better community-based care system. Um, uh, comprehensive state level planning, support for family caregivers, a focus on the workforce, helping people age at home and maintain financial stability, um, work on housing and deliver person-centered um, uh, program models when you're delivering services. And that's really how I'm gonna frame the rest of the presentation is through these particular six elements, identify practices in other states that might be useful to you folks uh, as you do this work in Massachusetts. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, you guys don't need to know about state level comprehensive planning. Um, nationally, people are hopping on this idea of a master plan um, for aging, or you can call it kind of a, a, a healthy aging plan. Um, it's a large overlap with what the AARP Age Friendly States Initiative. And, um, you know, not much for you guys to learn from other states, frankly, on this. Um, I've looked at your healthy aging plan that Alice Bonner helped put together when she was there. James talked about the one year um, uh, review that you folks had done. That's exactly the kind of process that you wanna be engaged in. You wanna situate it, you wanna plan ahead, you wanna situate it outside of Medicaid um, so that you can not have a Medicaid-based strategy, not have it be provider driven. You've got colleagues that are working on this in California, Colorado, Minnesota, and Texas. An offshoot of that is the age-friendly public health work that um, uh, Hartford has helped to stimulate and lead. And we think that this kind of long-term comprehensive planning, it's not particular popular in, in a number of states, but you folks in Massachusetts are doing exactly the right stuff. And then once you have those plans, uh, you need locals, like exactly what the collaborative is doing, holding states accountable, uh, state governments accountable for that. So sad to say for you, all I can do is wave pom-poms because you're doing the right work and there really aren't, other people are learning from you, I have to say on this one. Uh, next slide, please. Second area is support for family caregivers. There's federal activity that's been going on with the RAISE Act, but um, thanks also to a, a partnership that um, we have with John A. Hartford, um, we've really been trying to um, identify leadership activities by states to support family caregivers. And support for family caregivers can just, it, it, it's part of the age-friendly work that Terry was referring to. It's also just thinking about policies that make it easier for folks to care for their uh, older loved ones, to do what's necessary. And so exam what, what can states do to promote this work? Um, well, you've got an example from Alabama about a pilot program for respite care, training to do that at community colleges. Um, the folks in Idaho, you wouldn't normally think of Idaho as a hotbed for this kind of work, have got, um, they put together a navigator program to help with family caregivers and help them find what they need to, um, uh, to uh, help them serve their older adults. And then in Tennessee, they, they are very committed to their um, managed care plans and um, uh, they've required, so you, you think of their managed care contracts as uh, incorporating caregiver assessments. You know, so you ask your managed care plans to do this work. In um, uh, Massachusetts, you've got this hybrid strategy where for some of the um, adult populations, you're moving that responsibility from managed care to um, Medicaid accountable care organizations. Can you put the, can Mass Health put those requirements into those settings um, or where managed care still exists as in the case with um, uh, the PACE program and the DUALS programs, um, why not ask the managed care plans what they are doing to make life easier for the family caregivers? Next slide, please. So our third area is workforce. And I just wanna call out the, the, the tension that we are facing with the long-term, uh, in focusing on long-term care um, workforce. On the one hand, we want more staffing. We want livable wage for that workforce. It falls directly to Medicaid's bottom line. You know, the nursing homes um, don't make money on Medicaid. Um, they make their money on Medicare and on self-pay. Uh, New York ran smack into this program with their minute or this this dilemma with their um, uh, increasing their minimum wage a few years ago. Well, the state law to increase minimum wage meant that the state had to pay for it itself when it had to raise Medicare rates 
to pay for increased minimum wages in long-term care settings. Um, and this is a tough time that we're heading into um, when you look at Medicaid budgets and what uh, state budgets are gonna look like and how that's gonna fall on Medicaid. So we just, we have to be, I, to my mind, this just further increases the need to look for other settings behind, besides nursing home for those populations that don't have to be there. However, there are gonna be populations that will continue to need long-term care. And um, a couple examples, again, going to Tennessee because they've done a lot of work around um, uh, long-term services and supports is a value-based workforce incentive um, for individuals in, long -term, in the long-term care workforce um, to develop specific skills. Like how do you train people to live in community? How do you do cultural competency? How do you do crisis prevention and intervention? Long-term care uh, workforce members who completed those training were able to eligible for increased incentive payments through the state's Medicaid program. And then the Oregon Home Care Commission um, allowed itself to be an, the employer of record to give collective bargaining strength to um, home care workers so they could get livable wages and um, workforce training. So those are a couple examples around how you can work on the long-term care workforce from other, uh, other states. Next slide, please. Um, the fourth issue that we identified is how do you age at home with financial stability? Again, this is the pre-Medicaid program. We want to, our ideas, we want to work with these folks before they become, they need to go on to Medicaid. Um, Hawaii has a deep cultural tradition around um, supporting uh, their older adults. So it's not surprising that they started their Kapuna Caregivers Program that allows for working family caregivers to receive a daily subsidy from the state, that's state funds, to help provide care to, uh, their, to older adults and their family. Maine has tax credits for home modifications for older adults that can help people uh, at, uh, stay at home. Um, and we're particularly interested in the Long-Term Care Trust Act in Washington, which is a social insurance program to help folks save for um, uh, uh, the caregiving expenses for older adults. You see a whole list of eligible expenses this is a payroll deduction program, just like Social Security. It's state administered. Um, they passed it in Washington a couple of years ago. Um, and we think that it's, it's the sort of broad-based social insurance program that's necessary beyond Social Security that's targeted specific at the costs of um, care for older adults. Next slide, please. And so um, the fifth issue that we want to identify is this notion of affordable housing. This is just a slide that sets it up. Um, uh, the way to read this is that uh, everything is indexed to 2017. And um, this is a forecasted change in older, the older homeless population. I mean, we're not just talking about affordable housing. We're talking about trying to keep seniors from being on the streets up to a threefold increase just in the next 12 years in the um, uh, homeless adult population. So this is going to be something, it just at the, at the extremes, this is not only living people, helping people to live comfortably when they're older, but just keeping them off the streets. This is the kind of issue that we're looking at going forward. You know, and folks who live in the greater Boston area are certainly attuned to the price of housing there. Next slide, please. So what can we do about it? You think about these three bullets here as sort of, um, going from the most immediate need to longer term needs. First of all, um, there's rapid rehousing programs just to make grants available in case management services um, to help people get housed. Um, if they're in their housing, but at risk of losing it, you can have temporary rental sub, uh, subsidies. And then if you want them to keep it, you can have ongoing rental vouchers available through um, HUD programs. These, none of these are Medicaid programs. The final bullet on this page talks about um, all the different opportunities. Medicaid can't pay for housing, but it pays for housing counseling services. And I have to say MassHealth um, in general, is a, it's a very innovative Medicaid program. And so I shouldn't be surprised that they're probably at the forefront in terms of thinking about Medicaid waivers that can pay for tenancy, tenancy supports 
and other housing related services through Medicaid plans. Next slide, please. Um, the fifth area is these uh, uh, person centered program models. So, you know, even if we talk about, um, if you will, kind of preventive or community based services, in the end, folks are going to need services, specific services delivered by specific providers. These three are examples. They're probably not new to you, but just to call them out, um, you've got PACE programs that integrate Medicaid and Medicare um, money specifically targeted at keeping people out of nursing homes, the most frail elders. Um, PACE programs are small, but they have performed particularly well in a time of COVID. They're, um, they do not have the kind of mortality rates that um, Terry was citing for nursing homes. And there's a reason why, because they're delivering intensive care at home specifically to keep folks from um, uh, needing nursing homes because we know that homes are safer settings to be. Capable works on home modifications. That's a program out of Johns Hopkins um, that is starting to actually, it's, it's fairly widespread. Um, they look for either Medicare or Medicaid benefits. They can go either way to pay for a time-limited set of services to do, make home modifications to help folks stay at home. And then SASH, which started out in Vermont, um, coordinates social service agencies, community health providers, and nonprofit housing organizations, mm -hmm. again, to target older residents. This is our, a broader set of, if you will, kind of home visitation services than what Capable is talking about but they've also had a good track record in um, Vermont. They're probably a little bit behind capable in terms of spreading to other places. But again, it's, it is saying, okay, we're gonna use healthcare benefits to deliver specific services to help people uh, age at home for as long as possible. Next slide, please. So these are the overall goals. And this is easy to say, we wanna honor the wishes of patients and families. We want to help them age at home or in lower acuity settings for as long as possible. And then when they need skilled care, uh, as Terry and I have written about, you want to get it in focused nursing facilities um, rather than places that are trying to provide services to a whole bunch of different folks. Um, I just want to call out again how Massachusetts is working from a position of strength. I think the work of the Helping AG Collaborative is really significant in um, providing this kind of, it's not only community-based voice, but it's kind of long-term looking. I get, it does three things. It's a community-based voice, it's long-term looking, and frankly, it's an accountability mechanism for the state so that um, uh, when the state puts out these lofty plans, they have to be held accountable for making progress on them in a way that, as Terry says, makes sense for the local communities. For that to happen, um, there needs to be far-sighted funders like Tufts and Harvard Pilgrim that can make that happen. There need to be good staff folks like James, and there needs to be you folks who are doing work in the communities who are kind of knitting the work together. So, you know, I am um, I really salute the work that you folks are doing in your communities and the work that the Healthy Aging Collaborative does to kind of keep you connected to one another. Um, you will continue to see the fruits of this. There is a reason why states that do this kind of work like Massachusetts have, it, it pays off. It pays off in terms of richer civic life and ultimately a longer life expectancy. You know, where I'll close is that we're seeing this increasing gap in life expectancy by state. We, that's what we at the fund do. And that gap is coming because some states are enacting policies that pay more attention to population health. We shouldn't be surprised that Massachusetts is at the high end of that life expectancy uh, trend, and it's because of work that you folks are doing. So thanks a lot. I look forward to a good conversation. Thank you very much for that, Chris. And I'll, I'll say that, you know, if we ever get enough funding to, to engage a promoter, I, I think you're at the top <laughs> of the list because that was, I appreciate the pom-poms and the rah-rah and, and all, all the support and kind words uh, for what we're, for what we're doing. And, and just before we get to our community sort of response, um, you mentioned about housing, of course, so important as an issue in Massachusetts. And we have our, uh, our partners at UMass Boston's Gerontology Institute putting together a lot of data about what constitutes 
you know, economic security and old age. And what we find is the, the cost and availability of housing in Massachusetts really um, is something that, that sets the state back. And it even came up as a special domain, uh, a distinct domain in the state's plan. So the statewide plan is focused on six areas. One of them is economic security with housing being a huge part of that. But one area we've been lucky is we've been able to engage our regional planning agencies to talk about these issues in a different way and, and in partnership with, you know, the folks that talk about smart growth and housing choice and all of these different terms that, you know, may not have considered older adults to the fullest extent, but are, you know, are starting to do so. And they've been great supporters of, of, of this work as well. So, so thank you again. And with, and with all that, <laughs> with all that in mind, we're going to turn to uh, Laura Kitross from the Berkshire Regional Planning Commission. Um, and even though she's in the Berkshires, she's got the seaside background. And I will turn it over to Laura for her introduction and uh, talking about age-friendly initiative in the Berkshires and her question. Go right ahead, Laura. Thank you. Thanks, James. Um, and apparently the sun has decided to come out for the first time in days. And so it's shining directly in my window at me. So now I really look like I'm at the seashore, even though I'm in snowy, windy Berkshire County at the moment. Um, thanks so much. Terry and Chris, um, super interesting uh, presentations and just, it's always fun to hear things and hear new things that are happening. I mean, I hate that COVID got us to this point, um, but it, it gives new excitement to making some of the changes we should have made before, um, but that hopefully will take place now. Um, and thanks also to my other colleagues across Massachusetts. It's, it's always great to hear what's happening in other communities and to hear your questions and, and challenges and so on. So um, you probably know that Berkshire County is um, one of the more rural parts of the state. Um, we're in the far western part of the state, right on the New York State border. Um, and Berkshire County originally started in on the uh, age-friendly communities around 2015, when really it was changing from an age-friendly cities to an age-friendly communities um, program. Originally it was cities. And we were one of the first um, age-friendly communities organizations to start looking at it on a regional basis. Because when you have tiny little towns of 2,000, 3,700 people, um, they can't be all things to all people. They can't fully become age-friendly on their own. We depend on each other to share resources and so on. So it was really kind of a different way of looking at things. Um, obviously our primary goal, like most other age-friendly communities movements is to keep people in their own homes for as long as possible. When we did our survey back in 2015, 2016, 98% of people said it was important or very important to stay in their own homes. Um, but there was a lot of fear that they wouldn't be able to. Um, and that wasn't just related to um, affordable housing, though that was obviously a big part of it, but also just suitable housing. Was there housing available that would allow them to stay at home. Um, and, you know, it's only one of the things that we see sort of special challenges around rural areas and, um, you know, that what, what will work in a rural area as opposed to in more suburban or more urban areas. So I guess, Chris, my question for you is, you know, of the practices and policies that you discussed, what have you seen work best to support older adults in rural areas? Um, including the housing, but but just in general, of, of, of all the, the the practices and policies that you talked about, um, what should we really be thinking about here in a rural area? So uh, thanks a lot, Laura. I think um, I was impressed, you know, it's everybody, um, there's, there's rural and there's really rural. <laughs> and so we have rural areas in the Northeast. And then you, you, when, you, when you talk to your colleagues or our colleagues in the West, they're, they've even come up with another classification, which is frontier, um, uh, which is beyond rural. And um, some of those frontier communities are in places yeah. like Washington and state. And um, I'm really, you know, in, I used to, when I worked in state government, I was health insurance commissioner in Massachusetts. I used to remind our policymakers, our staff, that we tend to deal with 
cleavers, not with scalpels. Sometimes we want to, you know, we think that we're surgeons and we're designing these really targeted policy programs that work precisely the way that we want them. And our tools aren't that, aren't that precise. So in Washington State, what they've done is focus on money. And, and um, you know, I, I draw lessons actually from um, the, the Economic Relief Act, the, the payroll protection plans. Um, when we don't, you know, you don't really like to say that this is, this is in a different setting, but that was just a big cash transfer. And um, we get in those cash transfer programs, we get really overtaken with concerns about fraud, waste and abuse or about merit that somehow you have to do something to deserve it. But it turns out when you give people temporary cash, they use it in the way that you want to do it. And then, and, and I've, I've seen research that says the payroll protection plan, it, it allowed people to stay on jobs and they use that money for it for housing, for the, ba for the basic expenses. It wasn't like they used it to fly to Florida or something. And so I think that's really important in rural settings that you, in addition to provider services, you know, uh, focusing on specific providers, that becomes harder when you've got to cover a greater geographic community and things that are more focused on cash transfers to help people make the housing modifications, to help family givers, caregivers, to take care of their family members. That may be a more effective way than trying to come up with specific targeted programs that work better in, in high density settings. Um, so, I mean, in general, that's the lessons. I'm drawing them not only from um, uh, programs for older adults, but um, social programs in general. It's it's cash transfers tend to accomplish their purpose. You have to police the edges and um, maybe have some qualifications or some limitate time limitations, but let's not go overboard about it. This, this is often the, keep, keep the program simple. Um, so I, you know, I, I think in some ways it's easier if you have answers that don't have to deal with money, but sometimes these are money problems and we have to face up to that and um, help people have the resources now so that they don't incur more resources later if they end up in nursing home settings. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that was super helpful. Actually, it's a really interesting take. Great, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you, Chris, for that. Um, I'm gonna ask now for Christine Sullivan from Coastline Elderly Services and Age Friendly New Bedford uh, to introduce yourself and your organization, your initiative and your question for Chris. Go right ahead, thanks, Christine. Hey, everybody. And I will just um, repeat the thank yous to everyone for being here and, and really how helpful it is to hear what's going on in other communities, even around the state. We get kind of focused on our own work and it's, it's really very nice to hear what's going on in other places. Um, New Bedford got involved in age-friendly work uh, back in after a news headline in 2014 that announced that New Bedford was the worst place in the state to grow old. And that was thanks to the Mass uh, Healthy Aging Collaborative uh, research report they had studied. And so with that bad news, a bunch of community members jumped on that and by 2015 had decided to apply to become an age-friendly city and, and to address some of the issues that had been raised. So we were the fourth uh, community to apply for age-friendly status in Massachusetts. And um, obviously what follows that is a couple of years of research and writing and coming up with an action plan after speaking with residents and stakeholders. Um, and in 2018, we received funding from the Tufts Health Plan Foundation to go ahead and try and implement this action plan. And the really encouraging news that came out of that was just last year in 2019, the Chamber of Commerce announced that New Bedford was the number one place to retire, which was very exciting news for us. It was a big transition in just uh, four or five years. And that was based on things like um, cost and health access and education and, and safety. So we've made a lot of progress uh, in the last several years. We have more than 20 organizations uh, that are involved in the work with us, as well as multiple city departments. And of course, uh, 
a core group of residents who have been really committed to the project. Um, but with all of that good news, I will say that um, housing costs and costs of community-based services really are still a concern. New Bedford um, has almost 60% of the housing available is actually rental housing and more than a third of our seniors live alone. So with those two facts in mind um, and the fact that it's a lot of old style uh, tenement walk-up apartments, I wonder about a program like Capable if uh, funding is available to landlords to make improvements for residents. Um, and how would we bring a program like this to New Bedford? Thanks, Christine. And congratulations on your work in New Bedford. Um, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think, so I don't know the details of the capable program. I'm not mm -hmm. sure, it's a good distinction. I mean, it would follow that if you're making uh, improvements, um, it's gotta be, they have to have sorted through the issue of tenant versus owner occupied um, because you know a lot of Medicaid recipients are gonna be on, um, uh, are gonna be renting as opposed to owning their own place. So I can't imagine you're the first, you're the first entity to raise that question. But um, so my, the place to go for that is the same place to think about spread. And this is, ends up being very kind of tactical in some ways. Um, uh, for community leaders or communities who are working on, um, on these issues and see an innovation that they would like to um, uh, say, wow, could we, could we bring that here? There tend to be kind of like three levels that you got to play. One is to identify providers who might be interested in providing that kind of service if it was paid for. So you, uh, that, that becomes kind of part of the recipe. So you have to have um, providers who may, they might be existing long-term care providers or actually for some of these housing things, it, 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 it could be more on the housing side. We can talk about kind of the divide that exists between housing and, and healthcare providers and how to bridge that. Um, the second piece is to be able to have conversations with kind of the national program office. And it turns out there is a national program office for capable. Um, it's at Johns Hopkins University. I was just checking their website before I came on. They say that they are um, in um, uh, uh, Boston and, and in Lowell. I, don't, I couldn't quite find enough detail to figure out what's going on. But the interesting thing, and this is sort of how personal this stuff gets, is Johns Hopkins has retained Alice Bonner. So you can, you can talk to, if you can track down Alice Bonner, you can say, hey, I hear you're working with Johns Hopkins. What's going on with Capable? And right. how do we bring it here? And then the third area is to have a regular persistent conversation with your state partners, you know, whether to, to have access to, um, whether it's mass health and people there or uh, people in the, um, the aging office. So they know of your interest and they know that there is this kind of, desire. And then, frankly, that's the advantage of having a plan out there is you can point to the plan and say, you guys said you're going to do this. But you, um, advocates locally need to sort of be able to pull their head up every once in a while to have the state conversations and the national conversations. Um, uh, it, it, again, I'll go back to my own work as a state official. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And if we, you know, if I'm in, in at Mass Health and I know, geez, New Bedford's agitating for this, and New Bedford's got a provider, and New Bedford's talked to folks at the Cape at the at the Johns Hopkins office, I'm more likely to kind of plan in a way and and and, and respond to that. And 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 that that's one of the important things about community organizing is the ability not only to do the local work but to plug it into the state work and the national work. Thank you, very helpful. That's great, thank you both. And unfortunately for Alice Bonner, we can track her down. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll let her know, Chris, that you're signing her up for all this stuff. <laughs> um, so we're well, gonna- I, I, I should say, I just, I've heard, cause we've been trying to learn more about the capable program and, and my staff here told me that she's working at Johns Hopkins. So. That's pretty credible information, but yeah. you know, leave, leave the possibility that I was 
I was misquoted. <laughs> Terry, did you have anything to add to either one of those? I would just say that re related to Capable, the Urban Institute has a, a segment called Housing Matters. And in it, they talk about um, how renters can benefit from Capable. So that's just a follow on to Chris's point. Great, thank you very much. All right, so I just, I have to mention that we, uh, we have, miraculously, we ended way earlier than I was, than I was planning on, which is great. So we have some time for, um, for some questions that came in through the Q&A. And any of the agent dementia friendly communities that are on the call can, you know, unmute at any time or unmute your video. I don't know what that the term is on video unmute your video. I don't know what you can show yourself and turn on your display and, uh, and jump in with your thoughts as well. And while we allow time for uh, another couple of questions to come in just to say that I want to thank Karen Vosey from the Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Foundation who in my Brady Bunch square uh, setup is at the bottom, but helped uh, introduce us to Chris and, and kind of get the thoughts for this program going. Um, but, you know, like we always say, thank you to all of our partners that uh, and something I say maybe too often is uh, better to be lucky than good. And we're, we're lucky to have so many great community partners and leaders, so many great organizations that have bought into this movement and that that keep the momentum going, you know, starting with the Tufts Health Plan Foundation and, and going on to state government and our executive office of elder affairs, our councils on aging, and you know, the folks on our screen and beyond. So so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna pick off a couple of uh, questions that came in through the QA just to to mention uh, to anybody that wants to jump in. So starting with age-friendly health systems, there was a question about um, maybe there's an idea or mis misperception that age-friendly health systems are sort of confined to the hospital, but it, it's, it's a health system approach. So how do we get that going to long-term services and supports and other things that are maybe more community-based? Right, and thank you. The, it is completely the intention to have people think about a healthcare system as including every point of care. I always like to say that a health system starts at your kitchen table and should get you back to your kitchen table and no matter where you are. And so it's for us as uh, systems and providers to make that happen. And it's, it's a challenge, but it's why we're all talking about age friendly. Now we just have to make it real and stick. Here's an example. Julia Adler Milstein is a wonderful investigator. She's at UCSF. We asked Julia if she would um, do a study on post-acute care discharge information transfer to long-term care. And what do you think she found? There is none. And so, you know, it, it, how can it be that someone could get from Mass General to Hebrew Senior Life and, and not have their information with them? That is That is what's going on out there. And when you talk about uh, all the different places across the, the country. How often does an older person get to that next point of care? Nobody knows their medications. Nobody knows what their chief complaint is. That's unacceptable. And so systemness means that every element, every or part of the organization is uh, in step. And so, you know, when meaningful use was passed by the government, great thing to have, you know, electronic health records in hospitals, they intentionally did not do long-term care. And the reason was money and getting the system up and running. And so we have to get meaningful use systems in place for every part of the organization, including our public health offices, including our community-based organizations, so that we have uh, a better chance at making sure people get quality, quality and reliable, reliable care. Thanks, Sherry. Anybody yeah. else? Have any other thoughts on that? So I, I know this is sort of breaking the rules a little bit, but given that you mentioned meaningful use and that we're living increasingly in a virtual world and, and Chris and Terry, uh, if whatever thoughts you have either in your work or what, you're, what you've heard from partners, I wanted to talk about sort of the larger issue of digital divide and 
that can include internet access and affordability, access to devices, the knowledge to use those devices, and et cetera. So, I mean, you know, our communities, the, the four on our screen and, and across the state, across the country, are dealing with a lot of this. What have you heard as, you know, is there any support that might come from from health systems, from public health systems, to really kind of come together on this issue, recognizing that technology is really something that spans sectors and communities and can, can really help older adults and people of all ages. Have, have you heard anything or have, has any of your work collectively touched on this? Do you wanna lead? Do I want to? Uh, yeah, I, so, the short answer is no, our work has not um, uh, focused on technology, but I would say that um, like much, many other parts of, even more so than other parts of aging, I would say not only is this um, benefit from a non-healthcare perspective, you know, that we think about it, we don't use the healthcare lens, but we think about it um, uh, across all services. But in this case, I think this is one where um, uh, with a little bit of government um, prodding, the private sector can help a lot. Um, uh, the, we've been working in a whole, in an entirely different place on primary care and, and, and strengthening primary care. And a point that's come up is the importance of broadband access particularly in rural areas. So this, and, and it's come up in schools, you know, when you think about kids going to schools. So, you know, I, this, is, this is much bigger than just the, the community of older adults. And um, I think to focus on basic things like uh, broadband access, you can get a lot of partners with that. And then there are issues specific to older adults and the ability to use the technology and manage the technology. And even there, you know, I have to think that there are, and maybe Terry can talk about this from the CBS standpoint. There are a lot of private partners who want to help older adults learn how to use technology. You know, if we just think about this as a meaningful use electronic health record, that's way too narrow. You know, Amazon, Walmart, CBS, they all want to help um, older adults learn how to use technology in a reliable, safe way. And so, what are they doing and how can we hop on that train rather than take that on as a specific issue that we have to fix ourselves? I don't know, Terry, that's just sort of my uninformed thinking, but just- to <laughs> Hardly uninformed, Chris. Those are great points. Two things. One is I read an article in the paper yesterday that talked about you, uh, broadband should be seen as a utility, not a luxury. Yep. Yep. When, when you see broadband as a utility, just like electricity, then we'll get change. And so we all have to be pushing for that. It should be just a part of the fabric of this country in order to get an equity. Related to older uh, people and their use of technology, um, you know, what are we talking about with older? You, people usually say over 65. And I start laughing because those are all boomers who've got every device possible. And, and they're very tech savvy. Now, for those people who are less tech savvy, there's lots of ways to help them. And, you know, Joe Coughlin at the MIT Age Lab has shown us a lot of different ways older people engage with technology. So I think it's blatant ageism for anybody to think that as a category, older people don't do technology. You did not say that, Chris, but I have heard people uh, kind of, again, that broad comment about older adults and all of our work, we, we parse it by people 65 to 75, 75 to 85, 85 to 95. Now, when you get to 85 to 95, maybe you begin to get some parsing of distinction with regard to uh, people's capacity to engage with uh, technology. But I think we have to be precise in order to make sure that we, we know who we're helping and how we need to help them. Great. Thank you both for that spontaneous spur of the moment question for me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Any thoughts can I, can yeah, I jump in there? I, I just, I also think there's a layer of uh, kind of affordability and access that is related to um, people's knowledge about technology. So mm -hmm. we need to just remember that as well. We have a lot of folks in our community who just haven't had the access to be able to learn. Right. So any, anybody else on issue of technology? Well, going back to 
going back to our regularly scheduled program, uh, I, we had some questions about um, how can people find out if there's an age-friendly health system? I mean, we, we could call Alice Bonner, we could, we could bother <laughs> every, every five minutes, but is there, is there a way to find, find that out for folks on the call? Yeah, it's on the Institute for Healthcare Improvement website. It's also on the John A. Hartford Foundation website with the maps and finding out which, which, which um, age-friendly health systems are in your geographic area. Great. All right. We'll include that link in the, in the follow-up to all of this. Um, we had another question about caregiving that I'm going back to and looking on, on the fly here. So there's a question for Terry that um, an organization on the call, Greater Springfield Senior Services, has a long-term care ombudsman program. Is there anything we can do to further support residents in our nursing homes? Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, the first thing is support your ombudsman program. So I, some of you who may know my, know that I have, I've studied elder abuse and neglect since the 70s and worked with Lillian Glickman at the Executive Office of Elder Affairs in Boston, Massachusetts and Senator Jack Backman of Brookline who was there a very long time ago, but they, when they passed their mandatory reporting laws for elder abuse and neglect in 1978, uh, you had to have a response. The public had to have a response. Ombudsman programs were part of it, but also um, our, our wonderful adult protective service workers who are everywhere in the community. More recently, when I was uh, at Northeastern University, I worked with some of my graduate students in uh, Worcester to, to work with the adult protective service uh, uh, offices to determine how to uh, get to families before you have uh, people who who deteriorate so badly that they then become Medicare, Medicaid eligible for nursing homes. So support your ombudsman program, get to know who they are, ask them how to partner with them, uh, know the questions that they would ask, be ready to, to be engaged with them. Uh, very often what'll happen is, is uh, people are afraid of ombudsman because what their job is, is to go out and stand up programs that are in the best interest of the older adults. And sometimes it can feel accusatory and like they're trying to get you, but they're not. So work with them. That um, we had uh, a couple questions, including I, I got a, a text from somebody that keeps getting kicked off and coming back on. So speaking, going back to technology issues, um, but just about support for caregivers. Um, this question happened to come from uh, kind of a, what we call, Chris, a rural area of Massachusetts. And the fact that it's it's tough to get caregivers to uh, air, rural areas of Massachusetts where there might not be housing that they can afford, there may not be enough pay to 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 just get folks working out there uh, out in certain areas of the state or even in the country. So, you know, what can we do to kind of coordinate long-term care systems or to provide better support? I mean, there were questions in the ch chat about, you know. Can we support living wages and all these other kind of other uh, policies that are broader, you know, for not just caregivers, but for you know millions of other people? But so what do you think about getting you know, sort of an infusion of caregivers out to areas where there might not be enough caregivers? We're talking about um, home and care workers and home and community based settings, so professional caregivers who can do that. Yes, sir. Yep. Yeah. yeah, you know, I. Um, Boy, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. I would one one strategic partner that I think would be interested. So you have to think about okay, who who else wants this kind of work besides me? Um, and um, I don't know what the statistics are for Western Mass, but as more and more people go into Medicare Advantage plans, those plans have a real interest in. Um, uh, getting as much rehab and nursing care as possible done in community settings. So know who your Medicare Advantage plans are, know what services they provide, um, know how uh, and, and what they're providing in your local area because they, they're a source of funding for this. I mean, you got to pay attention to where, where the money comes from. And you know, that depending on how those Medicare Advantage plans work, particularly if they're regional, um, 
they're going to be easier to get a hold of and sort of talk about, okay, what are your covered services? What are your provider network? Um, because they have an interest in keeping people out of hospitals. That's, that's the goal of a Medicare Advantage plan is to keep people out of hospitals who don't have to be there. And if that means paying for um, these sorts of services, not, you know, not habilitative, not long-term services, but so that only gets you part of the way there. And then I, so that's one thought. And then the other is these um, uh, thinking about it as a community challenge rather than a healthcare challenge. So right. you're absolutely right. It is a wage challenge. It is a, it is a, um, a, a housing challenge um, because um, those, those are the sorts of barriers that are keeping people. Maybe another thing is if you've got, and I don't have a good example of this, but community colleges, you know, to the extent that you can think of community colleges and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a, a training and workforce pipeline that gets people into that setting, that might be another way to go. But I'm, you know, this is where we are, these workforce shortages. And I think that's why, you know, Maine a couple of years ago considered and ultimately rejected, but if we back again, you end up having to think about paid family caregiving. You know, how do you substitute family caregivers for um, places where there just aren't enough or it doesn't pay to have um, full-time uh, long-term care workforce. Terry, what do you, you got anything to add to that? No, I, I think that you covered that well, Chris. I, I am in supportive of paying family caregivers. I think that's a big part of the solution. I also think that I loved your point about it's a community issue. It's not a health health issue. So I'm thinking through all the, you know, community health workers are a growing group that can be very, very valuable. And um, I think that, it, again, th what are they looking for? They're, they do need a living wage, but they're also looking for respect for their work. They're looking for someone to call them back when they need a call back from a nurse who you know, needs to pay attention to them and support them. I think that um, there'll, there'll come a time when we have increasingly sophisticated apps, avatars, robots that'll help us with a lot of this work. But in the meantime, we have to deploy every element of our communities to address the care needs of older people in their homes. So I think churches, certainly the churches are doing a great deal of, of uh, work. We have our area agencies on aging. We've got our, our public health offices, but they're not in harmony with one another. They don't, what, what we found with our age-friendly public health work was that we got together all the area agency on aging people in Florida and all the public health service people in Florida. And the whole day was, was the, if you had one on one side of the table and one on the other, all day long it was, I had no idea you did that. I had no idea you did that. This is not hard. This is just knitting it together. And so bring your public health people together with your AAA people, with your, your church groups. If you've got a YMCA, bring them in too. And just think about how, how to work smart so that um, the right, you know, the, the right person's doing the right work at the right time. Yeah. Here, James, here's a follow up on that. Here's maybe a question for you. I'll turn the table since you're working so hard. Food, what's been your members experience with home food programs, Meals on Wheels or something else? Kind of that, that if we can demedicalize this stuff and make it more about maintaining connections. And I think Samantha's an expert in that. Are you Samantha? So, well, we um, piloted a, a food response program due to COVID and the response was that it was important. Um, we're looking at fresh produce, but our Meals and Wheels program that our Greater Springfield Senior Services programs did, it ramped up um, it, as, um, from COVID. So there is a definite connection to increasing those, those networks um, to get information out and to utilize them as for folks. Part of our challenge with all this is that all of our money is in medical care, but it becomes this sort of um, rabbit hole where we've got to get a diagnosis, we've got to get a service, and then we can bill and pay for it. And that's not really what these communities need. They need, they need connections, they need social services. It's like all the money is in healthcare, but all the need and the most effective stuff is outside of it. And so how can you, you know, the, 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 the temptation is always to medicalize it so you can get a bill, get a diagnosis, get a revenue, but that's a, that's a dangerous game. 
There, there is um, within the food um, industry, there's the conversation on food is medicine. So not looking at a prescription of, you know, um, other things other than um, prescription drugs, but using food, uh, food resources as a way to prolong health and healthy living. So food banks and uh, other food pantries are in advocacy for those type of things. And that's using the funding from the health system to directly um, help folks that need healthy food in their lives and that would help them in overall. Yeah, I, mean, I would add that we've just seen food be so central to the pandemic and to uh, what people need during this time. I mean, I think it's shifting a little bit now, but at the height of the pandemic, um, we were getting over, uh, over 450 calls in our office a week just for food. And our Meals on Wheels program that's run uh, by our uh, partner ASAPs and nonprofits in, uh, in Boston ramped up um, probably at the, at the height, probably close to 40%. They, were, they, they uh, did in additional meals, um, but also the need for groceries and, uh, and uh, was, was very, you know, we're still hearing a need for groceries um, from probably about 3,000 3, folks a week in Boston. And so part of what I talked about at the beginning, way, kind of way too quick, quick of a glance, was uh, a report that the Tufts Health Plan Foundation supported that looked at six different parts of the state and their response. And looking at food access <clears throat> was a major uh, adjustment for communities and community partners during the pandemic in terms of you had councils on aging uh, that were providing everything from frozen meals to grab and go meals in their parking lots, food banks partnering with regional uh, planning agencies like, like what, what Laura's been doing. I mean, there's lots of, there've been lots of points of contact for food access that have increased and people have done an amazing job in a, a lot of communities to figure it out. We even had one community in a more rural, again, rural part of the state, uh, that had a, a shed for their recreation parks and rec department. And they had volunteers turn it into a food pantry, a community food pantry. And just people stepped up with the funding and the time to put refrigeration and, you know, make it, uh, you know, kind of appropriate for dry goods storage and things like that so that anybody with a need can come. So there's, there've been such a variety of, 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 adjustments and innovations from this. So again, we, we listen to the communities and try to amplify what they're doing and show other communities that, well, this city or town did it over here, so it's possible, but, but Meals on Wheels and all of our systems have, have stepped up during this time. So more, more to be done, but we are coming up. It's 159. So I would love to keep it going, but we have to, we have to cut it at time, but I want to thank uh, Chris and Terry and our aged and dementia friendly community partners. Thank you so much for this. Um, you're going to be getting attendees. You're going to be getting a, uh, an evaluation, whether you like it or not, uh, automatically when you close the Zoom. Um, but please follow up with us if you are interested in connecting any of these dots between health systems, public health systems, caregivers, housing, all of these different things. And what we've been describing as the aged and dementia friendly ecosystem, um, you know, we're here to do that dot, dot connecting and, and help help you work together and help promote what you're doing. So, so thank you to everybody and have a good week. Take Thanks, care. James. Thanks, everyone. Thank